John Stuart Mill is as representative of the modern Western world as Aristotle is for the ancient Greek world and Aquinas for the medieval world. He was one of the major philosophers of the 19th century and one of the most significant English philosophers ever. He's quintessentially modern in three of his characteristic philosophical orientations, his naturalism, his secularism, and his liberalism. In his naturalism, Mill is someone who bases ethics on observable phenomena, things that can be empirically determined, and things that are fully and thoroughly a part of nature, as nature is understood by modern natural science. That is, as a mechanism governed by laws of efficient causality that connect causes and effects according to regularities that are invariant and that can be observed and determined in their uh, law-like regularity um, by observational methods. And in particular, as we'll see, Mill bases ethics uh, entirely in the human experience of pleasure. He's also secular in the sense that there's nothing in Mill's ethics that relies upon any transcendent or divine source of morals, as Aquinas's uh, ethical theory quite clearly does. Although Mill will happily accept uh, religious people into the fold of utilitarianism, uh, he doesn't believe that there's anything in utilitarianism that is incompatible with uh, Christianity, for example. Utilitarianism is entirely neutral with respect to religion. One can be a utilitarian and be a complete atheist, just as well as one can be a utilitarian and be a, a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or what have you. Uh, assuming, of course, that those religious orientations would allow you to be a utilitarian. The uh, obstacle is not from the perspective of utilitarianism, at least not as Mill sees it. Utilitarianism is a neutral ethical theory in that respect. And so it is uh, something that belongs to the secular sphere. And then finally, his liberalism. In his liberalism, uh, Mill is a complete egalitarian. Uh, he is someone who believes that everyone counts equally and that uh, ethical decision-making should take everyone into account with a kind of impartiality. And in this respect, of course, uh, Mill stands uh, opposed to the kind of elitism that we find in someone like Aristotle, as well as opposed to the hierarchical view of uh, being that someone like Aquinas um, adheres to. So Mill is a natural, naturalist, secularist, and a liberal. And so are we. Uh, whether we like it or not, uh, as modern people, we naturally have those uh, mental reflexes. And so Mill is someone who um, naturally resonates with us in um, those respects. Now, we're studying Mill as the epitome of modern ethical thinking. Uh, Mill was a theorist. Mill was someone who developed an ethical theory, but he was much more than that. He was a public figure in addition to being a philosopher. He was a leading public advocate for actual liberal reforms, uh, reforms that would ease the condition of the lower classes in England, that would uh, mitigate the uh, various harms that were caused by the class divide in England. And also, notably in Mill's case, um, he was an advocate for the political and social equality of women which is extremely rare, uh, sadly, among the great philosophers. Like Aristotle, Mill's ethics is merely the first half of an integrated moral and political system, and his political philosophy remains uh, influential to this day, as influential as his moral philosophy. Uh, he is perhaps the um, most important classical defender of the political philosophy known as liberalism. Certainly, uh, his defense of freedom of speech and expression, his articulation of uh, the so-called harm principle, the principle that one should have um, the freedom to do what one likes as long as it's not harming anyone else, uh, 
uh, in his defense of tolerance are, are basically um, the rule of the day for uh, Western democracies. Mill's ethical theory, called, of course, utilitarianism, was invented only a generation prior. However, as we'll see, Mill um, claims to see indications of this theory as far back as Plato and in the uh, Epicureans, although that depends on a very particular interpretation of Plato and the Epicureans, but um, there's some truth in what he says, even though at the same time it's perhaps a bit of a stretch to uh, cast them as utilitarians. Mill um, tends to see utilitarianism everywhere, but that's fine. This theory, utilitarianism, provided the theoretical foundation for the social and political movement in Great Britain in the 19th century known as philosophical radicalism, philosophical radicalism. Uh, and this was a movement that advocated progressive social and political forms, uh, reforms rather, social and political reforms, uh, founded by Jeremy Bentham, Jeremy Bentham. Bentham uh, invented utilitarianism as an ethical theory, and the theory was further developed by uh, John Stuart's father, James Mill. The goal of this theory was to provide a principled basis for evaluating human actions, uh, public policies, and social institutions by the standard of maximizing human happiness. Unlike Aristotle, however, happiness here was construed by Bentham in thoroughly hedonistic terms. That is to say, happiness was just pleasure. Happiness was just pleasure. That is hedonism in the philosophical sense. This theory was radical in that, according to the utilitarian, all happiness counts equally to every other. So the happiness of the King of England counts equally with an East End beggar. Mill was uh, famously the subject of his father's progressive educational experiments. You can read about that if you're interested in one of the many uh, biographies of John Stuart Mill. These uh, progressive experimental uh, experiments in education were intended to train Mill from childhood to become the leader of his generation of liberal reformers. He was basically engineered to be um, a liberal reformer leader. Utilitarianism, this work here, which uh, you may uh, acquire in this nice thin little volume uh, that you can stick in your back pocket from Hackett. Uh, but if um, you're on a budget, as most of us are, uh, you can find many open access uh, copies of this book, not necessarily the most readable, but you can find this book online in various versions. Um, if you can find a cheap copy of this somewhere, it might be useful for you to just acquire it just for the sake of your eyes to make it easier to read. But at any rate, uh, this book is open access now because it was published back in 1863. Uh, it's in English, so you don't have to worry about the, having the latest uh, translation. The, um, this is the, bo the book in 1863 that Mill is most famous for, at least with an ethical theory, it's his most famous explication and defense of the ethical theory by that name. This um, is a popularization of the theory. It was first published in the Highbrow Literary and uh, General Journal uh, Frazier's Magazine. So it was intended for a general audience, not merely for philosophical specialists. At the same time, however, it is a rigorous defense of the theory and it's been the subject of discussion by philosophers ever since. In discussing this work, uh, I will be, of course, quoting from it. And when I quote, I will try to cite by the chapter and the uh, paragraph number. Oftentimes, I won't be mentioning the chapter if it's obvious from the context which chapter we're working in. I'll just cite it by the paragraph number. Sometimes I may slip um, if my mind is running in a different direction. And, and I may cite it from the page number of this work. So um, I apologize in advance for that. I'll try to catch those and um, stick to setting by, par by paragraph number. So uh, for those of you who are 
using a different text, you might want to try to find one that has numbered paragraphs or um, put, you know, put the numbers in yourself um, so that you can follow along. By the time that Mill wrote Utilitarianism in 1861, the conversation around utilitarianism had been ongoing for around 70 years already. This is why Mill's utilitarianism may sometimes give the impression to the reader that uh, he or she is entering into a conversation that's already ongoing, because it is. At the same time, though, uh, this work is intended as an introduction to utilitarianism. Uh, but it takes the form of an apologia, uh, in the sense of the apology of Socrates, an apologia, a defense of the theory of utilitarianism against its many uh, despisers who have arisen in the generation or two since uh, Bentham first introduced uh, the idea. So let's jump right into this work. Chapter one, general remarks. Mill starts the work with, uh, it must be said, a highly tendentious representation of the history of moral philosophy. This isn't unusual for a great moral philosopher. They tend to, of course, see the history of moral philosophy before them um, in light of their own theory. And of course, they have a natural bias towards a sort of pessimistic interpretation of the history of moral philosophy, because if anything, if everything had just been fine and dandy in the history of moral philosophy, of course, they wouldn't need to uh, write anything and, or correct what had gone wrong. So Mill um, follows um, in this tradition. He asserts that there's been no progress in moral philosophy. The situation is the same as in the days of Plato. Um, there's, the subject is beset by confusion. We still lack a clear sense of what the criteria of right and wrong are. And as an added bonus, he represents Plato, as I said earlier, as a utilitarian, which is dubious at best. Now, certainly uh, we can observe here that moral philosophers in the Thomistic Aristotelian tradition, uh, in the natural law tradition, would balk at this, and with good reason, Certainly, we can see um, a kind of progress. I mean, it depends on your perspective, of course, but we can see a kind of development, a kind of refinement of Aristotelian ethical theory uh, in Thomas Aquinas. You can look at my videos on that. It's quite obvious. And then in the centuries between Aquinas and Mill, there is a continual development and refinement of natural law theory. Certainly, there are debates, but it's within a tradition, and it's a tradition that... Um, certainly made progress intellectually by any reasonable standard in the sense that issues were considered, refinements and distinctions were made on the basis of problems that were found, and arguably you could say that the theory was developed and improved. However, that's natural law theory. And long before Mill's time, um, going back uh, at least to the days of John Locke, natural law had been associated with conservatism. And that explains why the long and rich tradition of natural law represents no progress at all for Mill from Mill's liberal perspective. Now, to this distortion of the history of Western ethical theory, uh, Mill adds a distortion of the uh, philosophy of science. He perpetuates a canard that was... Um, tired even as in his own day that somehow ethical theory is deficient compared to science. And so therefore ignores the um, old, old Aristotelian caution against comparing uh, speculative reason with practical reason, com comparing science with ethical theory. Ethical theory isn't trying to be science, and so it can't fail um, to achieve the standards of science. It's an inexact science by its very nature. That's all it could be. And so um, it shouldn't be evaluated by some criteria of scientific rationality. That's apples and oranges. But even um, in terms of Mill's own understanding of science, um, I think he gets it wrong here. He claims that there's an asymmetry between science and ethics in that he says, 
uh, particular truths precede general principles in science. Particular truths precede general principles, whereas in the latter, principles precede particular truths. So um, what he seems to mean here by this is that in science, we first uh, collect the data and then we come up with our theory. Uh, or perhaps he means that uh, in science, uh, data has to be somehow responsible, or the theory rather has to somehow be responsible to the data in the sense that if we have a theory, we falsify it by the data. And so the particular truths sort of serve as the um, court of decision making uh, in that area of intellectual inquiry. Whereas in ethical theory, supposedly principles precede particular truths. But this isn't right. In fact, in, scientific, in um, science, scientific principles, scientific paradigms and models precede the data, and they determine in advance what will count as data and how it will be interpreted. And every scientific theory has anomalies. Um, if, you know, there were perfect scientific theories, they no longer become the subject of scientific investigation. They just get sort of established as canonical. Uh, to the extent that there's still an ongoing um, investigation, there are going to be anomalies, data that don't fit into the theory, and scientists are fine with that as long as they're confident that the theory they're working with is the best theory, and best is determined by scientific values, uh, values like uh, parsimony, explanatory power, explanatory scope, and so forth. So there's actually less of a difference between science and ethics um, than Mill lets on, but he's operating with an enlightenment um, paradigm or kind of myth of uh, scientific objectivity that was um, standard in the 19th century. But uh, by the 20th century, with uh, a work such as Thomas Kuhn's um, Structure of Scientific Revolutions or Paul Feyerabend's Against Method and the uh, rise of the history of science and the sociology of science, this is no longer accepted. But in on Mill's view, uh, in science, we just collect the data, then we arrive at our principles, our, our laws, our scientific laws, by generalizing from the data. Uh, whereas in the case of ethics, we only have to start with a principle. The principles precede the particular truths. That is, that what makes uh, a particular action right or what makes a particular action wrong is that its conformity or lack of conformity to a general principle. Whereas supposedly the inverse is true in the case of science, that what makes a principle true or false in science is its conformity to the data. So what sometimes philosophers call the direction of fit is different. Um, and what this tends to do for uh, Mill is to suggest that we have to have general ethical principles in order to be able to uh, live a moral life because it's these general principles that are going to determine for us what actions count as right and what actions count as wrong. Uh, I would note here that this is not the way in which Aristotle sees things, just to draw a point of comparison. For Aristotle, you'll recall that there could be general rules but general rules don't play the kind of governing role that Mill sees. Uh, they may play that role, incidentally, in, in Aquinas. But in Aristotle, certainly, general rules can only follow from particular judgments of practical reason. At most, they are general summations of such judgments. Uh, they're not, you know, the judgments are going to be, in a sense, weightier than the general principles. And... Uh, even Mill, I think at one point, uh, seems to acknowledge that oftentimes moral philosophers, not him, of course, but other moral philosophers, will propose principles that seem to be falsified by the judgments. That is, if you propose a moral principle and that moral principle doesn't seem to fit our everyday judgments, then um, that's cause for rejecting the principle rather than for rejecting the judgment. And I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not utilitarianism, if, it, if it's consistently applied, would um, be one of these uh, moral theories.
this is an issue that we will have cause to discuss um, later on. So it immediately becomes clear that Mill has a very different picture from Aristotle. Uh, in the second paragraph of chapter one, he writes, Though in science the particular truths precede the general theory, the contrary might be expected to be the case with a practical art, such as morals or legislation. All action is for the sake of some end, and rules of action, it seems natural to suppose, must take their whole character and color from the end to which they are subservient. When we engage in pursuit, a clear and precise conception of what we are pursuing would seem to be the first thing we need, instead of the last we are look forward to. A test of right and wrong must be the means, one would think, of ascertaining what is right and wrong, and not a consequence of having already ascertained it. So like Aristotle, Mill holds that ethics is based on the pursuit of ends, E-N-D-S, ends. But unlike Aristotle, Mill holds that rational moral deliberation must be based upon a principle, a principle that is antecedent to the decisions of rightness or wrongness of actions. And he conceives of, the, of this principle as a decision procedure, for ascertaining right and wrong as a kind of a litmus test. Is it right? Is it wrong? We test it by the principle. And also, unlike Aristotle, Mill is a consequentialist, a consequentialist, which is to say he's someone who believes that morality is assessed in terms of the consequences of actions. A consequentialist is called that because of the importance they place on the consequences. The morality of an action is assessed based upon the consequences of the action. So we need a principle of morality that can serve as a test of right and wrong, according to Mill. And this test must be in terms of how the proposed action will further an end which must therefore be given in a clear and precise conception of what we are pursuing. We see here, I think, very much the modern technical, mechanical conception of rationality at work. This is not Aristotelian phronesis anymore, or prudence, a kind of discernment or um, discrimination that's maybe more akin to uh, the way in which a connoisseur of, of art would, um, or food even would discern the quality of a thing. That's Aristotelian prudence. That's Aristotelian phronesis. And that is not what Mill is thinking of here. Rather, this is a technical mechanical conception of rationality. And this is very much um, in line with Mill's modernism because the modern mind sees the paradigm of rationality really in the process of the engineer. Um, the way in which an engineer approaches problems and thinks about things, uh, you know, how do I achieve this particular outcome? How do I get from um, here to there in terms, in the most economical and efficient terms? Uh, and that's the way in which I'm going to determine what action, the course of action I should take. And that is the way Mill is conceiving of rationality. It depends in the background of a kind of mechanical conception of the universe. The universe is a machine that can be manipulated technically through human tools that we devise. And our rationality consists in dividing these, devising these tools and in implementing them. Sometimes this is also called instrumental rationality because it conceives of rationality as an instrument for achieving certain goals. Now to his credit, Mill doesn't simply assert consequentialism. He compares and contrasts his view with a view he calls the intuitive school. This was something like a modern successor of natural law theory that claimed that we have something called rational intuition that makes moral principles self-evident. Mill casts himself as differing from such people, but not over what moral laws there are, 
Instead, he differs with them over what these moral laws are founded on. So Mill is not going to disagree with someone like uh, Aquinas, for example, that stealing is wrong, um, that you know murder is wrong, these sorts of secondary principles of the natural law that we talked about in Aquinas, uh, in our series of videos on, on Aquinas. These are not the kinds of things that Mill is going to dispute. Rather, it's at the level of the foundations that Mill is going to disagree with uh, the natural law theorist or the the rational intuitionist who was the successor of um, uh, the natural law theorist in the modern period, or one of the successors, I should say. So he differs over this, this kind of person, not over what moral laws there are, but rather over what they're founded on. Are moral laws to be understood as a priori principles of pure reason? A priori principles of pure reason. A priori meaning, of course, that these are things that will be justified if we're called upon them, to, if we're called upon to justify them rationally, not by appeal to experience, but I appeal to self-evidence or appeal to their status as having um, a kind of um, uh, status as a logical uh, axiom, as Aquinas does when he compares the basic principle of the natural law to the basic principles of speculative reason, like the law of non-contradiction. So are they a priori principles in that sense, principles that would not be justified except by appeal to self-evidence or derived from self-evident logical axioms? Or, and here's the option that Mill opts for, are they a posteriori generalizations that are founded upon experience and inductive reasoning. So that's one fundamental dispute. Is morality a priori or is it a posteriori, founded on generalizations that are based upon experience and an inductive reasoning? The difference basically is between the kind of rationality that one finds in pure logic and pure mathematics, that would be a priori, or a posteriori uh, rationality that one finds in the empirical sciences that depend upon experiments and collecting empirical data and so forth. So Mill makes two complaints against rational intuitionism. And this is in uh, the third paragraph of the General Remarks chapter. He makes two complaints. First, he says, it seldom makes any attempts to make out a list of the a priori principles that are to serve as the premises of the science of morals. It seldom makes any attempt to make out a list of the a priori principles that are to serve as the premises of the science of morals. So um, this has some legitimacy to it. There is in Aquinas, for example, a kind of open-endedness, and Mill is thinking of other uh, rational intuitionist figures. Uh, one of the most imp important ones from the century before Mill would have been Samuel Clark, um, who was a rational intuitionist uh, as well as a... Um, metaphysician and uh, Christian theologian. So they don't make out a list, the complete list of the a priori principles. What are these a priori principles that are to serve as the premise and how are they justified? So there's no not an effort to make a complete system. And second, they don't make any effort to reduce these principles to one first principle or common ground of obligation. So the, think of the ten, 10 commandments. Uh, even in the Bible, there's this drive to try to say, okay, well, what's the greatest commandment? Or implicitly, what, it, what, it, what do all these Ten Commandments have in common that is their unifying principle? The human mind tends to uh, want to have that kind of unity of system in ethical matters, I think. It's fair to say. And rational intuitionists or uh, natural law theorists that preceded them don't make efforts to reduce these various principles to a first principle or common ground of obligation. Why would this matter? Well, one reason, of course, might be that if you have a, a bunch of moral rules and you say that these rules are self-evident, you have to follow all of these rules, uh, whenever you have more than one rule, there's always the possibility, at least theoretically, that the rules could conflict with one another. And then how are you going to settle such conflicts? And if you can't, it begins to seem like perhaps the foundations of morality aren't really as solid as they first seem because it seems like you're forced to do something wrong in that circumstance. But if you have a principle, 
that governs or covers all of the particular rules, then you can at least theoretically um, figure out how to negotiate these kinds of apparent conflicts among the secondary rules. And one thing that we saw with Aquinas is that for him, the general principle of morality, which is to pursue good and to avoid evil, um, scores high on the self-evidence meter, but perhaps in terms of the practicality meter, uh, it doesn't do so well because it doesn't uh, serve this function of being able to help us to uh, resolve conflicts between the secondary principles. So, you know, if you have the principle you shouldn't hurt people's feelings and you shouldn't lie, we know that these often come into conflict. How are we to ascertain which what we should do in a particular circumstance when we're faced with a conflict between the principle you shouldn't hurt people's feelings and the principle you shouldn't lie? Well, to say, well, you should do the good thing and avoid the evil thing is no help to us. But Mill is going to try to propose a principle that is going to be helpful. Namely, well, you should do the thing that's going to produce the greatest happiness, going to produce the, the best outcome in terms of the greatest happiness, as we'll see. So that's, what, that's the way Mill is thinking here. He says we need, to, we need to have a general principle because we need to be able to resolve conflicts at the level of these secondary principles. And Mill is also dissatisfied with moral philosophers because of a kind of explanatory gap, we could call it. Moral philosophers tend to simply promote commonly accepted beliefs to the status of self-evident moral precepts. And we want, Mill thinks, an explanation of why these things are moral precepts. We want an explanation that gives us the ground of these precepts and some unifying law or fundamental principle that itself, of course, needs to be well-founded in some way. But uh, what moral philosophers tend to do, I think it's fair to say that you do often see this, is just sort of take for granted that the conventional moral beliefs of their society, these are the moral precepts. And so my society says, okay, you know, and this, for some reason this, this tends to be in the sexual sphere. So my society says that um, homosexuality is wrong or masturbation is wrong or something like that. And so my moral principle must rule this out. Um, but oftentimes in the attempt to work out that argument, it doesn't actually work as straightforwardly as it would um, uh, be desirable for it, to, for it to do. So this is a problem that Mill thinks um, needs to be resolved. Um, we can see here the inspiration of modern science again which successfully managed to reduce explanations in terms of diverse essences and substantial forms. That was the medieval science, believed in the essences of things, substantial forms of things. It reduced these to one common principle. So rather than explaining, you know, why um, a tree falls in a forest and why a rock falls off a mountain in base, on the basis of the essence or the substantial form of a tree and a rock, you could explain both of them in terms of one covering principle, namely the law of gravity, to take an extremely uh, simple example. And that's, that's the aim that Mill thinks should be applied in ethical theory as well. And of course, in the course of this process in the development of modern science, the reduction of all of these different diverse explanations in terms of the various essences of things, in, in terms of a few common laws that covered everything, uh, many occult qualities that were attributed to things were could be eliminated. And I think it's fair to say that Mill thinks if we isolate this central principle of morality that covers the greatest number of sort of certain moral beliefs, um, we can eliminate some peripheral beliefs and we can, we can come to realize that things that were commonly or conventionally accepted as being wrong or being right, for, for that matter, like slavery, for example, um, or the oppression of women, uh, these things can be eliminated from our morality once we arrive at the principle. Just like in natural science, once we arrive at uh, modern natural laws, many occult qualities that were be believed in in the Middle Ages were eliminated. So that's the ideal. He expresses his scientific ideal for ethical theory in uh, the third paragraph, Um, this is towards the end of the paragraph, a substantial paragraph. So look towards the end. 
the last few lines. Uh, so he's speaking here about people who ascribe a priori authority to the ordinary principles of morality. And he says, to support their pretensions, that is to say their unfounded claims, there ought to either be some one fundamental principle or law at the root of all morality, or if there be, or if there be several, there should be a determinate order of precedence among them. And the one principle or the rule for deciding between the various principles when they conflict ought to be self-evident. So that's the, that's the idea. We should have one principle of morality. Ideally, this would be a self-evident principle, as well-founded rationally as could be. And this principle should be uh, the thing from which we derive all of the other secondary moral precepts that we adhere to. And if uh, we find in our society or in our tradition a moral precept that can't be derived from this principle, then we should get rid of it. For Mill, to lack a clear idea of what the fundamental principle of morality is, is dangerous. It implies uh, vitiated morals. That is, it renders moral judgments confused or uncertain. And one can see how one might become bothered by the inexactitude and vagueness that seems to accompany the idea of what the prudent man would do in Aristotle. And so Mill is opposed to this kind of fuzziness in um, morals. Mill attributes a quote, whatever steadiness or constancy, sorry, let me start again. Mill attributes, quote, whatever steadiness or consistency that these moral beliefs have attained, unquote, to, quote, the tacit influence of a standard not recognized, unquote. That's a quote from the fourth paragraph. That is to say, um, to the extent that received moral principles are plausible, it's because they tacitly are based upon a principle that hasn't been recognized yet. And this standard, of course, is going to be the principle of utility or the greatest happiness principle that we, we shall examine um, shortly. So Mill concludes the chapter by stating what the goal of this work will be. And it will be twofold. First, to explicate what the theory of utilitarianism holds. And second, to, quote, contribute something towards such a proof as it is susceptible. To contribute something towards such a proof as it is susceptible. And um, this is sort of mealy-mouthed. Um, it's a mealy-mouthed way of saying that, or admitting that there will be no strict proof of the principle of utility. In fact, uh, Mill is quite frank about this. He immediately admits that, uh, quote, the questions of ultimate ends are not susceptible of direct proof, unquote. So the ultimate ends can't be susceptible of direct proof. The, the implication being that we justify um, the ends that we're pursuing in terms of some higher end that they serve, but that implies that the ultimate end has nothing above it that can um, justify it. And so it is not going to be susceptible to justification or proof in that sense. However, he says, the considerations may be given capable of determining the intellect to either give or withhold its assent to a doctrine. That's in the last paragraph. Considerations may be given capable of determining the intellect either to give or withhold its assent to a doctrine. So there won't be a strict proof, um, presumably modeled on logic and mathematics. It's not going to be that kind of proof. But we will be able to give considerations, um, motives for belief, that this is actually the true principle, even if they don't serve as a knockdown, drag out um, demonstration. Okay. Okay. Chapter 2, What Utilitarianism Is. Mill immediately confronts two stereotypes of the utilitarian. These are first, that the utilitarian is too dry. Uh, the utilitarian is a kind of drab 
sort of like a communist apparatchik who cares only about efficiency, productivity, um, you know, uh, end results, as opposed to enjoying the path by which you get there. And so the utilitarian is too dry to the detriment of pleasure. So you think of a boring, unornamented utilitarian building or a drab but functional utilitarian garment that's useful, but it's not beautiful or fun to wear. That kind of idea. Um, so that's one objection, the utilitarian is too dry. The second stereotype is that the utilitarian is too voluptuous. That is to say, uh, he's a crude he's hedonist, a voluptuary here in the, by now I think somewhat um, obsolete Victorian sense would be a person who just lo loves to indulge in all kinds of sensual pleasures all the time. He notes the irony that, the, of course, these two stereotypes contradict each other. How can the utilitarian be this dry sort of pleasureless person and at the same time be a, a voluptuary? the first paragraph, in the center of the first paragraph, he says, Every writer from Epicurus to Bentham who maintained the theory of utility meant by it not something to be contradistinguished from pleasure, but pleasure itself, together with exemption from pain. And instead of opposing the youthful, the youth, youthful let me start that again, but in, in, instead of opposing the useful, to the agreeable or the ornamental, have always declared that the useful means these, among other things. So the utilitarian conception of usefulness is conduciveness to pleasure. That's what useful means. So there's no opposition between utilitarianism and pleasure. What about the second view that uh, the, these utilitarians are these voluptuous swines who just love to wallow in, um, you know, sensual pleasure all the time. Um, so Mill defers his answer to that question. He wastes little time in moving from this statement about the connection, the conceptual connection between utility and pleasure directly to his formulation of the principle of utility itself. In paragraph two, he says the following, the greatest happiness principle holds actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure and absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. So this is therefore the principle of utilitarianism, the principle of utilitarianism, I'm trying to get that reflection out there, the principle of utilitarianism as a moral theory is the greatest happiness principle. Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to promote the reverse of happiness. What do we mean by happiness? Simply pleasure. What do we mean by unhappiness? Simply pain. And these are understood as um, inversely proportional uh, things, such that to seek pleasure is to seek the diminishment of pain, to seek pain is to seek the, um, or to, to avoid pain rather, is to seek the increase of pleasure. So that's it, the greatest happiness principle. This is the principle of morality. This is the moral law. It is to serve as the criterion of right and wrong for Mill. What are we to make of this principle? One thing that strikes us at first is it seems a bit loose in its language. So actions are right that tend to promote um, happiness and wrong as they tend to promote. What's going on here? This What's with this tending? Um, now, on one level, this seems, strictly speaking, incorrect. If you want to be a pedantic and a nitpicker, you might say, well, that doesn't seem right because let's say, for example, um, hugging may tend to promote happiness. That is giving someone a hug, right? But in many cases, uh, it's clearly wrong to hug someone. So, um, you know, you can certainly make someone uncomfortable or even traumatize them by hugging them in certain circumstances. 
even though hugging certainly does tend to promote happiness. So what what is he getting at here by qualifying in this way? Is he just being sloppy? Probably not. One possibility that will be considered in more detail later is that Mill is uh, what is called a rural utilitarian, a rural utilitarianism. A little uh, dagger asterisk here. Now let's just do it straight up asterisk. That's better. So if you look at these tendings, and we'll put a question mark. Um, are these meant to, this is the question, possible interpretation, not necessarily a certain conclusion that we should adopt, but is this language of tending meant to indicate that Mill is a rural utilitarian? What do we mean by a rural utilitarianism? Well, it means that he's a utilitarian about the rules. <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward. That is to say, uh, this would be contrasted with an act utilitarianism. So th that's the contrast. Rule utilitarianism versus act utilitarianism. So a rule utilitarianism is a, is a a rule utilitarian rather is a utilitarian about the rules, whereas an act utilitarian is a utilitarian about actions directly. And it may be in saying that we're applying this principle to what tends to promote that he sees the principle as justifying something like all things equal moral rules rather than individual actions. Uh, so we justify, um, you know, a particular moral action as being all things equal, all things equal. It's a good idea to, you know, um, return what you've borrowed, right? That's a, a good moral precept. You should return what you borrowed. But, um, of course, in the famous example where, you know, you borrow your friend's axe, let's say, to uh, chop wood, and he comes over and he's, he's fuming and he's angry at his wife and he says, you know, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. Where's that axe you borrowed from me? Right? Under those circumstances, you shouldn't give him the axe. You're violating the general moral principle. But the reason you're doing this is on the basis of the, the governing principle, which would be the greatest happiness principle. This would not promote the greatest happiness to give your friend back his axe when he's not in his right mind and he wants to kill his wife with the axe. So... Uh, it could be that th that's what Mill means by tend here, that he's a rule utilitarian, that you, the greatest happiness principle doesn't uh, derive directly, uh, or doesn't apply rather directly to actions, but rather to these rules. Um, now, at the same time, maybe he isn't a rule utilitarianism. <laughs> I keep saying ism. He, maybe he isn't a, a rule utilitarian because it's it's a questionable theory, rule utilitarianism as, is a questionable theory. Uh, and it's also questionable as an interpretation of Mill. So uh, this is disputed. But that might be one thing he means by saying that, that he's applying this um, principle to what tends to promote happiness. Because he thinks of the greatest happiness principle as something that, that applies principally to rules um, rather than directly to actions. That's a possibility. Otherwise, it seems like he should say that actions are simply right in proportion as they actually promote happiness. That would be a more act utilitarian way of putting it. So that's one um, issue about this way to define the principle, but otherwise it seems pretty straightforward. For another thing, there's its definition of happiness in terms of pleasure. Uh, this is, of course, disputable, as Aristotle does. He considers you know, the pursuit of pleasure as only one conception of happiness. Mill takes it for granted, apparently, here that this is what happiness is. On the other hand, in a broad sense, Aristotle would agree with Mill. Everything does depend on how pleasure is understood. Now, this principle um, that the ultimate standard of value or morality is pleasure gives um, rise to an objection in some quarters that utilitarianism is a theory that's only worthy of swine. Um, and this is very Aristotelian. Uh, 
this is remember this is the view that uh, Aristotle didn't say swine, um, but he said uh, cows. <laughs> he said that it's only worthy of grazing animals. Uh, the the view that pleasure is the ultimate end. But Mill rejoins quite forcefully to this that well, this presupposes that human beings are only capable of the pleasures of which swine are capable. And so if you say that against uh, pleasure, then you're really saying more about yourself than you are about utilitarianism because you're implying that you can only imagine uh, those pleasures of the animals as um, possible pleasures. But this is a basic error. So in, in paragraph four, he says, the comparison of the Epicurean life to that of beasts is felt as degrading precisely because a beast's pleasures do not satisfy a human being's conceptions of happiness. Human beings have faculties more elevated than the animate, animal appetites, and when once made conscious of them, do not regard anything as happiness, which does not include their gratification. Skipping a bit, um, skipping two sentences there. But there is no known Epicurean theory of life which does not assign to the pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments. So the the pleasures of the intellect, intellectual pleasure of the kind that, of course, Aristotle advocated as the greatest pleasures, the pleasures of feelings and imagination, like engaging in art and uh, music and poetry and things, and the pleasures of the moral sentiments. These are pleasures that are higher pleasures, a higher value than pleasures that are of mere sensation, he says. The problem is... Mill's uh, neo-Epicurean proposal presupposes the ancient Greek notion of a qualitative hierarchy of pleasures, as we see in Aristotle, for example. But on what basis can he erect such a scheme? Bentham, his predecessor, Jeremy Bentham, that I mentioned earlier, explicitly rejected any qualitative distinction. He, he regarded this as essential to the, the anti-elitist egalitarian thrust of philosophical radicalism. So for Bentham, only intensity of pleasure, duration of pleasure, and uh, the extent of pleasure matter. Bentham's view fits the anti-elitist egalitarian animus of the philosophical radicals and the reformers. Everyone's pleasure is equal. So he notoriously said, prejudice apart, pushpin, a children's game, uh, is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry very much the democratic ethos. It's not as if we're going to say, well, you know, because we want to encourage people to have higher pleasures, um, there, there'll, be, there'll be no tax on philosophy books. And instead, we'll make up the money by placing a higher tax on, um, you know, uh, video games or something like that. Um, no one would accept this because we bought into the kind of anti-elitist democratic ethos that Bentham wanted to promote. He thought utilitarianism should make its moral decisions just based upon what people in fact find pleasurable, not in what you believe, what you wish they did find pleasurable. But Mill is um, kind of retrograde from, let's say, Bentham's perspective, because he sides with ancient Epicureanism and the ancient attitude generally in declaring that pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments have a much higher value as pleasures than those of mere sensation. In other words, the pleasure that one gets from discussing poetry with friends or from an afternoon spent painting in a meadow in the open air or of listening to the orchestra or of volunteering to visit the elderly at the nursing home, that would be the pleasures of moral feelings. Um, these are much more valuable pleasures than you know, getting drunk and rowdy at the ballpark. So Mill's, well, why is Mill making this move? Well, I think his own experience told him he was right about this. He had an encounter with poetry that, that saved him from a nervous breakdown um, that was induced by the one-sided utilitarian education that his father had subjected him to, probably. So I think that's where this is coming from. He, this, Mill is a great advocate of the well-rounded life. And so he believes in the, the importance of this. Also, as we'll see, he thinks that um, the pursuit of these higher pleasures is necessary in order to achieve happiness for the individual. One of Mill's major contributions to the util utilitarian theory of his predecessors was the addition of qualitative distinctions. 
to the theory of pleasure. But how is one to make a, a qualitative distinction between types of pleasure? So Mill explains this in uh, the fifth paragraph. If I am asked what I mean by difference of quality and pleasures, or what makes one pleasure more valuable than another, merely as a pleasure, except as being greater in amount, there is but one possible answer. Of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. If one of the two is, by those who are competently acquainted with both, placed so far above the other that they prefer it, even though knowing it to be attended with a greater amount of discontent, and would not resign it for any quantity of the other pleasure which, of which their nature is capable, we are justified in ascribing to the preferred enjoyment a superiority of quality so far outweighing quantity as to render it in comparison of small amount. Now, it is an unquestionable fact that those who are equally acquainted with and equally capable of appreciating and enjoying both do give a most marked preference to the manner of existence which employs their higher faculties. So in fact, this is a very old argument form. It goes back to Plato's Republic. Um, Aristotle gives a kind of argument here, but it goes back farther to Plato's Republic, Book 9, um, where Plato argues that the philosopher's pleasures are superior to the honor lover or the money lover because the philosophers had the experience of the pleasures of the honor lover or the money lover, and the philosopher chooses philosophical pleasures as being far superior to these other types of pleasures. So Mill is saying here that the qualitative superiority of a pleasure as determined by the judgment, the considered judgment of the person who's experienced um, all types of pleasure, or at least if we're comparing two, the person who's experienced both, um, do, if that person determines that one is preferable, then questions that uh, Bentham focused on, the intensity of the pleasure, the duration of the pleasure, the extent of the pleasure, these become irrelevant. That one can pursue, you know, it's rational to pursue a small amount um, a less, of a less intense uh, pleasure that lasts um, for a shorter period of time if that pleasure is of a sufficiently higher type over a lower type of pleasure that lasts for a long time and is more intense. And Mill um, goes into uh, great detail in kind of filling this out. So uh, we see this in paragraph five, um, giving a lot of uh, nuanced detail to make this plausible uh, that, um, for example, he begins by saying, very few human creatures would consent to being changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. So one might say, oh, you know, sometimes you might be in the state of mind where you might say, oh, look at that fool over there. They're able to, you know, just live within this blissful state of ignorance. And here I have this knowledge that weighs down on me so much. Um, I wish I was a fool. But really, if, if push came to shove, Mill saying, you don't really mean that. You, A person who has knowledge wouldn't really choose to become a fool, to undergo a lobotomy or something like that, um, you know, in order to uh, just to, to be contented with more base pleasures. Now, one objection to this that Mill considers is that there are, in fact, apparent counterexamples, um, examples of experienced people who have chosen lower pleasures. So, for example, think of all the artists, writers, musicians who have ruined themselves through overindulgence in alcohol and drugs and, and even food. Mill hypothesizes that many people capable of higher pleasures indulge lower pleasures out of temptation against their better judgment. They don't really prefer the lower pleasures, but they're merely tempted to it. 
and part of this is he mentions later on that uh, oftentimes people become addicted to these certain kind of pleasures before they're sufficiently cultivated to be able to appreciate the higher pleasures. So they become addicted to something before, um, you know, they're able to really appreciate anything better. And then by the time they are able to appreciate something better, it's too late because they're already addicted to the lower pleasure. But they don't really prefer the lower pleasure. They, they wish they were rid of the, the, te the temptation or the addiction. What about the elitism of this, though? Isn't this an elitist view? Doesn't this restrict the highest pleasures accessibility only to an elite to have the leisure and um, the talent to be able to appreciate them? And here, Mill wants to preserve as much as of the traditional egalitarianism and anti-elitism of the philosophical radicals as possible. His view is that many more people would prefer the finer pleasures in life if they had the time and the opportunity. Most addict themselves to inferior pleasures before they're allowed to sample the higher pleasures. But if they were just given a proper education, this is one, one of the places where Mill places uh, great importance upon the educational system and reform of the educational system, that people need to be given, and people need to be given the opportunity to, to cultivate a, an ability to appreciate music and poetry and philosophy and science and higher pleasures. Um, as well as, of course, on being given a moral education that encourages them to appreciate the pleasures of moral feeling above lower pleasures. They need to be given that at a young age before they become addicted to drink um, or other lower pleasures. And similarly, uh, the economic system needs to be reformed to allow people enough leisure to be able to enjoy these pleasures. And if that were the case, then you wouldn't have this elitist, apparent elitist divide between the leisured class and those who the working class who can't appreciate higher pleasures everyone would be able to appreciate these these things and this has been uh, historically a liberal ideal okay so this leads to the first discussion question is mill successful in providing a principal basis by which to make a qualitative distinction between higher and lower pleasures why or why not first discussion question is mill successful in providing a principal basis by which to make a qualitative distinction between higher and lower pleasures. Why or why not? Even if one rejects the notion that a person is happier himself for indulging in nobler pleasures, there may still be utilitarian grounds for uh, promoting such nobility. Um, I misspoke there, sorry. If, if the, the idea is that, that if you think that... Um, if you agree with the objector that the pursuit of nobler pleasures is just going to tend to make people more unhappy, uh, it would be better if like, people could just enjoy the lower pleasures, which are more intense and more accessible and so on. Uh, Mill thinks that there's actually a utilitarian reason for encouraging people to cultivate the higher pleasures, even if it's only a minority um, and even if it's to their personal detriment. And that's because the, the greatest happiness principle uh, is the principle of utility. And that says that we should pursue the greatest happiness overall, not the happiness of any particular individual. So um, he refers in paragraph nine to the utilitarian standard. And he says that standard, the utilitarian standard is not the agent's own greatest happiness, but the greatest amount of happiness altogether. That is this principle it doesn't refer to your own happiness. It just simply refers to happiness, period, in an absolute sense. You should promote the greatest happiness, whether it's your happiness or whether it's other people's happiness. And we should consider these completely uh, indifferently. And the noble person, and I think this is clearest if you think of the person who takes pleasure in um, benevolent actions and in moral feeling and this kind of thing, this person clearly is going to be um, a more useful person to society and in that sense is going to promote the greater happiness more than the selfish person who's just concerned with their own pleasure. So it's good to promote the noble person, the, the cultivation of noble people in society, even if that doesn't make the noble people happier. At least it makes other people happier. It makes society as a whole happier. Mill next considers a different pair of objections to the greatest happiness principle in paragraph 11. First, that happiness is unattainable. Happiness is unattainable. 
and therefore cannot be the rational purpose of life and action. It's a kind of quixotic pursuit. Pursuing happiness, come on, get real. That's, you're, not, you're, no, you're never going to be happy. And many people have, have said this, claimed this. Um, in the modern period, this was a view that Jean-Jacques Rousseau expressed that was later endorsed by Immanuel Kant. And so the idea that happiness is unattainable was a common view. Um, so that's one objection. It's like this principle is uh, irrational because it, it, is, it insists that we pursue and promote something that's unattainable, namely happiness. So he needs to, he needs to counter this. Is happiness really attainable? That's the first objection. And then the second that he raises at this point is that happiness is something that human beings have no right to, that human beings don't deserve happiness. This, of course, is an old Christian idea um, that human beings are sinful and so we don't deserve happiness. If we're granted happiness, it can only be as a free gift of God at most. And so the renunciation of happiness is thought to be the more virtuous course of action. You see here the, the, the ascetic ideals of monasticism. I'm going to live a rigorous ascetic life, a life of deprivation, life of self-denial. And that's virtuous because this is really sort of accepting my what I really deserve as a human being and doing penance for the sake of humanity or what have you. So those are the two views he considers. Happiness is unattainable and happiness is undeserved. Happiness is unattainable. Happiness is undeserved. So utilitarian principle is, is bunk, in other words, because it... It encourages us to orient our lives around the pursuit of something that's unattainable. And even if it were attainable, it's undeserved. So against this, Mill writes that even if it were true that happiness were an unattainable end and therefore could not be the purpose of human action, there could still be a negative form of the utilitarian principle, which aimed at mitigating unhappiness and pain as much as possible. In any event, Mill is not imagining happiness to be a state of uninterrupted rapture and ecstasy. Instead, the, the happiness that the utilitarian aims at is something much more humble and modest. Uh, we see, if you look at the second half of the 12th paragraph, he says, he's describing the, the happiness that, that uh, those who advocated happiness as an end were speaking of. He says, the happiness which they meant was not a life of rapture, but moments of such. And it exists, so moments, maybe there are moments of rapture, but it's not an uninterrupted rapture. Um, happiness is in moments of rapture, yes, but in an existence made up of few and transitory pains. Few and transitory pains. So you're happy if your pains are few and they go quickly. Many and various pleasures with the decided predominance of the active over the passive and having as the foundation of the whole not to expect more from life than it is capable of bestowing. A life thus composed to those who have been fortunate enough to obtain it has always appeared worthy of the name of happiness. And such an existence is even now the lot of many during some considerable portion of their lives. The present wretched education and wretched social arrangements are the only real hindrance to its being obtainable by almost all. So the utilitarians aiming at this kind of humble, modest life, realistic expectations, just trying to minimize pain, have many and varied pleasures that are rooted in an activity. So things are actually doing maybe occasional moment of rapture here and there. But for the most part, uh, that's not what's um, being claimed here. And he says this is entirely, there's no reason to think this is entirely attainable. It's it's obtained. And we see the empiricism of Mill's theory coming through here that will become prominent in later chapters as well. Uh, we experience that people are able to attain this happiness, at least in some portion of their lives. Uh, Mill clear, clearly here is a modern in his conception of happiness as it's more of a state rather than a kind of judgment on the individual's whole life as eudaimonia is for the Greeks. So he suggests that you can be happy for a portion of your life and unhappy for another, which is not what Aristotle would say. But um, that's Mill's view here. And he says, look, we experience this. This is experience. Something People do actually attain, that, attain this. So happiness is not so unattainable as people think. And the keys, he says, um, in beginning in 13, are tranquility and excitement. With um, tranquility, people find that they can be content with very little pleasure. 
just having a peaceful life. You don't need to have a lot of pleasure. But if you have a lot of excitement, then people find that they can tolerate much pain. And a happy life tends to be a balance between tranquility and excitement, alternating, since each tends to provoke a longing for the other, right? If you're if you're in a period of tranquility for too long, you live out in the mountains somewhere, uh, you, you get bored and you want some excitement. But then if your life is, is you know, too, too much drama uh, and conflict and so on, it might be exciting, but you long for some tranquility. So this shows the versatility of the happy life and the variety of options for its attainment. The two causes of unhappiness that Mill sees are actually both the unhappy person's fault. So, you, you know, uh, you have no one to blame for your unhappiness but yourself for Mill. You got yourself into your own mess, as uh, the great trio Wilson Phillips sang back in the 80s. It's your own selfishness and want of cultivation for Mill that leads to unhappiness. Of course, this, these are just general uh, generalizations. There are going to be exceptions to this. Mill shows himself to be a classical liberal advocate of universal education so that everyone can become a well-rounded person. He says in a paragraph 14, which is a paragraph containing a lot of kind of liberal idealism, there's absolutely no reason in the nature of things why an amount of mental culture sufficient to give an intelligent interest in those objects of contemplation should not be the inheritance of everyone in a civilized country. Um, the problem is bad laws and exploitation that prevents universal cultivation. Otherwise, everyone could be given a sufficient education and the appreciation of poetry and art appreciation and music theory and so on and be able to appreciate these things. Also, like the optimistic liberal that he is, in, the, in this paragraph he says that poverty in any sense implying suffering may be completely extinguished by the wisdom of society combined with the good sense and providence of individuals. So he's, in, he's an um, optimist that poverty could be eliminated if we only had the will to do it. Now, what about simple bad luck? This seems to be kind of the elephant in the room because we are all aware of the fact that people seem to be thrown into unhappiness through no fault of their own due to simple bad luck and through no, and through no fault of their side necessarily either, just through simple bad luck. So he thinks even this, though, can be greatly mitigated um, th through social reforms. Towards the end of the paragraph, he says, this is 14 still, as for vicissitudes of fortune and other disappointments connected with worldly circumstances, these are principally the effect either of gross imprudence, of ill-regulated desires, or of bad or imperfect social institutions. All the grand sources, in short, in short, of human suffering are in a great degree, many of them almost entirely, conquerable by human care and effort. What about this alternative uh, moral assessment that says that happiness is something that human beings have no right to? and that the renunciation of happiness is a nobler and more virtuous course of action. Mill doesn't deny that noble self-sacrifice of one's personal happiness for a larger good is often an admirable course of action. However, this presupposes that there's some higher ideal that's worth sacrificing for. Furthermore, he says, quote, this is a 16th paragraph, it is only in a very imperfect state of the world's arrangements that anyone can best serve the happiness of others by the absolute sacrifice of one's own. You know, we, it's a sad statement on our world that people have to sacrifice themselves and sacrifice their happiness in order to ensure the happiness of others. But the utilitarian view not only allows self-sacrifice, but it even encourages it, provided that it increases or tends to increase the sum total of happiness. Because that's what the utilitarian principle says. It just says promote the greatest happiness. And this leads to a crucial aspect of Mill's utilitarianism. Namely, its absolute demand for practical impartiality. Mill writes in the 18th paragraph, The happiness which forms the utilitarian standard of what is right in conduct is not the agent's own happiness, but that of all concerns. <laughs> 
as between his own happiness and that of others, utilitarianism requires him to be as strictly impartial and as a disinterested and benevolent spectator. Mill even goes so far as to connect this with Jesus's admonition to love your neighbor as yourself. Mill says utilitarianism means this literally. You, you should treat your neighbor's interest exactly the same as your own. And if you're acting to promote the greatest happiness, you should promote the greatest happiness of people generally, not merely your own. You should weigh your own happiness um, as entirely equivalent to or equal to uh, the weight of other people's happiness. But to make impartiality practicable, Mill advocates first reforming social institutions to harmonize the self-interest of every individual with the interest of the whole community. That would be the goal, so that you wouldn't have to choose between your self-interest and the good of the community. And if you had the right, if you had the right social arrangements, you would have to choose. That's again part of this reform program. Also, he says education and public opinion should be so arranged as to indoctrinate people with the ideal of impartiality. The goal is to make it inconceivable to a person that, that he might be happy apart from the common good. Mill recognizes, though, that even with favorable institutions, um, favorable education, and public opinion shapers, absolute impartiality may be a high bar for um, humanity to reach. And this represents another stock objection to utilitarianism. Um, Namely, that utilitarianism doesn't pay attention. This is in, in uh, paragraph 19. Um, they say it is exacting too much to require that people shall always act from the inducement of promoting the general interests of society. But Mill responds, it is more unjust to utilitarianism this particular misapprehension should be made a ground of objection to it, inasmuch as utilitarian moralists have gone beyond almost all others in affirming that the motive has nothing to do with the morality of the action, though much to do with the worth of the agent. He who saves a fellow creature from drowning does what is morally right, whether his motive be duty or the hope of being paid for his trouble. He who betrays his friend that trusts him is guilty of a crime, even if his object be to serve another another friend to whom he is under greater obligations, but to speak only of actions done from motive of duty and in strict obedience to principle. It is a misapprehension of the utilitarian mode of thought to conceive it as implying that people should fix their minds upon so wide a generality as the world or society at large. So, uh, a number of things are going on here. One, Mill is not saying that we must always act within an impartial frame of mind. Rather, it's the end result that matters. This is the importance of a consequentialist theory. It's different from a virtue-based approach to ethics. And the, the rightness or wrongness of an action doesn't have to do with the kind of motive that um, underlies it, but rather just with the end result that's produced. It doesn't matter if you have an impartial frame of mind. This is why if you could rearrange society to promote um, the greater good by people pursuing their self-interest, that would be perfectly fine for a utilitarian. But utilitarianism draws a sharp line, a sharper line than traditional morality between the morality of an action on the one hand, that is the criteria that make an action moral, and the motive of the action on the other hand. The morality is determined entirely by the consequences. The motive is seemingly irrelevant to the morality of the action. Mill admits, however, that the motive may still say a lot about the worth of the agent. It would seem, however, that this worth has to be cashed out in terms of being a reliable, good content producer. Mill seems to think, perhaps erroneously, erroneously that adopting the impartiality of utilitarianism will not cause any major change in the way one lives one's life. He suggests in this passage that people can still be expected to devote most of their energy to the happiness of themselves and the people close at hand, um, later utilitarians have disputed this, especially if you think globally on a global scale. So this objection that, uh, to utilitarianism, that it's too uncaring about, about people's motives, it doesn't place enough weight on motives, and it's too demanding of impartiality, 
is the kind of thing that leads people to think of utilitarians as being cold and unfeeling, a cold, calculating approach to morality. And Mill kind of pushes back against this idea as well. Um, one final thing, I see, see we're going rather long here, so uh, one final issue that we need to bring up, though, even if just briefly here, is Mill considers that the, the objection that the calculations that utilitarianism requires are too difficult and impractical. They require us to, you know, figure out what what action should I pr pursue that will produce the greatest happiness? And here again is where <clears throat> I think the the role of intermediate rules comes in. That is, Mill tends to, uh, I, I think, think of the greatest happiness principle as applying only to these secondary precepts, these kind of time honored rules, moral rules. And then we in, in the, in the uh, heat of the moment in everyday life, we just act on these secondary precepts. We act on these rules. We don't consider what their justification is, which ultimately is going to be utilitarian, but we don't consider that in everyday life. So he says, this is in the 24th paragraph. Uh, Defenders of utility often find themselves called upon to reply to such objections as this. There is not time previous to action for calculating and weighing the effects of any line of conduct on the general happiness. And he says, the answer to this objection is that there's been ample time, namely the whole past duration of the human species. Um, and then he goes on to say, you know, humanity has ample experience of what things tend to conduce to the greater happiness and what things tend to produce to tend, tend to produce unhappiness. And th this is embodied in these kind of secondary principles. So, you know, returning what you have been borrowed, what, what, returning things that you have borrowed is one of these, would be one of these time honored principles that people have seen as tending to produ produce happiness, not in every case, but tending to produce happiness and so forth. So Mill is suggesting here that these secondary principles are the ones that guide actions and that these are assumed to have been established as the most useful by common um, experience. And then the general principle of utility would be only evoked in the case of conflicts uh, between the secondary principles. And this is what he suggests um, at the end of, of chapter 2. If utility is to be the ultimate source of moral obligations... Utility may be invoked to decide between them when their demands are incompatible. So that's where utility comes in. When these secondary precepts that have become time-honored and are, seem to lead to conflicts, then we fall back on the principle of utility to determine which of these precepts we should follow in the particular instance. Okay, so this leads to the second discussion question. Has Mill successfully answered all of the main objections to utilitarianism in this chapter? Are there any answers he gives that you find unconvincing? Are there other cogent objections to utilitarianism that Mill does not consider? Justify your answers. So once again, second discussion question, has Mill successfully answered all of the main objections to utilitarianism in this chapter? Are there any answers he gives that you find unconvincing? Are there other cogent objections to utilitarianism that Mill does not consider? Justify your answers. <clears throat> 